Good morning, everyone. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to explain the shear stress due to bending moment. So let me remind you what we did before. Before, we had shear stress due to torsion, which means if I do have a shaft and I applied a torsion, this torsion, it is like, look at my hand, look how the cross section is like fractioning with each other until they twist out or, yeah, until they twist out. So that's like the cross section at the location where it's gonna break, it feels friction. So that's the shear stress due to the torsion. And if you remember before, when we wanted to calculate the tau for any point within the cross section, the tau was function of the radial distance. So any point away from the center of the circle, the furthest I go, the highest the stress. This is what we did before. And whenever we have a stresses that is not uniform, and uniform here means that at any point within the cross section, the stresses are not equal. I mean like all the points here has a stress, different stresses because the row is gonna be different, depends on where that point related to the center. So the first is the point, the high is the stress. And if the points, if the stress at different points change, this is what we call non-uniform stress. But when we talked before about shear stress due to pure shear force, when we have this bolt that hold two plates together, this, pl this bolt had this shear force. And when we wanted to find the shear stress at that cross section for that bolt, we just simply said force is equal, tau, which is the shear, is shear stress is equal to force over area, which tells you at any point within the cross section feels the same stress. And when we have this case, this is what we call uniform stress. So uniform stress means any point within the cross section feel the same stress, and non-uniform stress, which means the stresses are different within like points are different in the cross section. The stresses are different in the cross section. What we're going to do now, we're gonna see, okay, what is the shear stress now due to bending? So we have different, we have shear stress due to different uh, forces. And now we're gonna focus on this. But before I do so, let's, let's, let's um, explain the term of average. So before also, when, when I had, for example, this axial force on this beam, I would say the cross section for that beam, if this is like circular cross section, I will say force over area. And the concept that any point within the cross section feel the same stress, this is a uniform stress. I just explained this a slide ago. But we add a term here, it's called average. And average here means the cross section feel a constant stress. The stress is constant within the cross section. So we can call this average, average, average normal stress, and we called this earlier, this tau, average shear stress. So whenever you hear a term average shear stress or average normal stress, that's when you know the stress is uniform in the cross section. Okay, let me, let me just briefly explain before I go in details what you, you should expect with the shear stress due to bending. If I do have certain layers of wood that they are not glued together, and I applied a force in the middle. So if they are not glued together, you're gonna see the plates due to the bend, this force and how it's gonna bend, the plates or the layers gonna slide. And this slide, the layers are frictioning with each other and this friction is, is the shear stress, which is the shear stress now due to, the, to this bending moment. And if we want, this beam to behave together or behave as a one unit because now it's, it's not behaving as a one unit because if you look, if you remember before from the bending lecture, we had something we call the radius of curvature and we had for every, for the beam that's bending, we have a radius of curvature and we have a center of the arc or the center of the curvature, how, or, or how this beam is bending about. There is a center of curvature. If you notice here how they are sliding with each other, every, every beam here gonna have different center of curvature. And if the center is different, that's mean the beam is not acting as a one unit. But if we 
applied or we had, we glued the layers together or we added a fasteners inside or a bolt inside, that's when you can see, now it's, it's behaving, this beam, as a one unit. And as you look at the end here, we have, this is the radius of curvature, and then we're gonna end up with a point of the, the center of the curvature. And if, if all the layers here has the same or has a common center of curvature, that's when you know the beam is acting as a one unit. Here, but the beam is not acting the, as a one unit. That's why this is not like gonna be as strong as this one, okay? Another concept here that I need to explain is the uniform and non-uniform bending. Remember, I explained a moment ago the uniform and non-uniform stresses. Now we have a uniform and non-uniform bending. And it's important because we're gonna need it, need it later in, in this lecture. When I do have a concentrated bending moment at the ends, and I try to find the, sh the, 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 uh, the reactions at the support, you're gonna find the reaction is equal to zero and therefore the shear force diagram gonna be zero. And if the shear force diagram is gonna be zero, that's when you know that the moment is gonna be constant. If the moment is constant, meaning the moment is not varying, we call it a uniform bending. But when we have, for example, now one bending moment, if you have bending moment, now we're gonna have reaction because it wanna counter that moment. We're gonna have a shear diagram, and this shear is wrong. I should draw it that way. I should draw it that way. When you have a shear force diagram, that's when you're gonna have a varying bending moment, okay? When you have a varying bending moment, we call this non-uniform bending. And when we have a constant moment, we, we call this a uniform bending. It's important just to understand this because we're gonna need it later. Last thing that I want to explain, when we explain the normal stress lecture and the bending stress lecture, and we, we went through normal stress distribution, we need the normal stress distribution to understand which part of the beam, for example, has a compression and has a tension due, due to that bending. But there is something we can get out of this also. Imagine this as a reinforced beam and, and reinforced concrete beam, and then we put at the bottom here, or at the location we, we have tension, we usually put steel, because concrete is weak in compression, sorry, weak in tension and strong in compression, so we need something to resist the tension. That's why we put the steel. So if we want to find what tension force we will design the steel rebars with, we first look at the stress distribution, normal stress distribution of the beam, and we will see the compression side, sorry, the tension side. So the tension side, we have a triangle, and we can convert this triangle to an equivalent tension force. So we can find an equivalent tension force and this tension force, so I'm gonna say F tension, is equal to stress, which is 200. This is stress, megapascal, which is Newton millimeter square. And I'm basically gonna find the area of this triangle, which is half, base times height, but I'm still missing a dimension and I'm gonna multiply by this width of the beam. I'm basically calculating the volume of this to get a force. And this is the equivalent tension force on that side of the beam. And the top side is gonna be in compression and if I want to find the resultant compression force that this upper side of the beam gonna resist, I want to find this volume. So I will basically said, say half base time height, which is half 200 times half times, if the height is 60, as you see here, I'm gonna say this is 30. And then I'll multiply this by 20. And this is gonna equal 60,000 Newton. So, this side of the beam, we have a 60,000 Newton tension force. And where we got that, we just found the resultant from the stress. So if we found the resultant of the stress, we're gonna get tension at the bottom, 
And if you want to find the resultant compression, we just basically calculate the area times the dimension, which is the width. Okay? Okay, now let's... Last thing, because I'm going to need this in this example, this is something we call glue lamb, which is type of a timber that is glued laminated timber. It's, create, it's made of layers of wood, and they are glued together. Okay? I'm going to need this because in this example, I do have a beam and I, which has a point load in the middle, 9 kilonewton, and the cross section of this beam made of two layers of glue lamb of a height of 150 millimeter, I gave you the area, I gave you the moment of inertia, and I actually drew the shear force diagram and bending moment diagram for this beam. Let me write it here, bending moment diagram. Okay, so what I want to do with this beam. So I'm gonna take this part out, which is A, B, C, D, which is 300 millimeter away from the support, before applying the load, this element or this beam or this section was like this. But after applying the, the, the 9 kilonewton, this shape, A, B, C, D, gonna bend like this. And from one side, from A, B, which is here now, I do have a bending moment of 135. And CD, which is here, I do have a bending moment of 2.205. So I took this section out, which is ABCD, and I just want to study it. And you're going to find I do have a varying moment from both sides. Because obviously, since you have a shear force diagram, you're going to have a varying bending moment. If you don't have a shear force diagram, that's when you're going to have a uniform bending. But this guy, I don't have a uniform bending. I have a varying bending moment. So let's study this part. If I want to find the delta M, which is the change in moment that's gonna happen in, uh, that happened already in that beam, I'm gonna say delta M, there's two ways to find delta M. Delta M, it is 2.25 minus 1.35, which is the change in the moment between this and this. What, what the change in the moment that happened? And if I calculated this, I'm gonna find it is 0.675 kilonewton meter. And there is another way to calculate this d, d, um, delta M. So delta M, you know from, from the lecture that we, the area method for the calculating the bending moment, to find 1.35, we're gonna, we basically multiplying 300 times 4.5. So if I multiplied 300 millimeter, but I'm going to change it to meter, so 0.3 meter times 4.5, it is 1.35, and that's how I got this. So the moment here is equal to the area of the shear. And if I want to find the moment at this point, I'm going to add all this area. But the change in the moment that happened here, it is basically this area, which is 4.5 times 0.15 meter, which is 150 millimeter. So I can also say 4.5 times 0.15, you're going to get 0.675 as well. So basically, delta M is equal to V times delta X, which is V is the shear, and DX is this X distance that I'm having. And it's D because it's a small. I'm not taking like the whole distance, it's just this dx. And dx here is equal to 150 millimeter. Okay? So why did I do this? Because I want to study what is happening to this beam due to this varying bending moment. I do have a varying bending moment. Is that stable or no? That's what I'm trying to figure it out. So to do this, as if I'm trying to draw the normal stress distribution for this phase, CD, due to that moment, and I want to draw also the normal stress distribution to the, this phase, or this section, due to this bending moment. And basically, if I want to find the moment at A, it is going to be the same as moment at B, and it's going to be 
1.35, which is the bending moment, Q Newton meter, multiplied by 1,000 square to convert from Q Newton to Newton and from meter to millimeter, and then 75, which is Y, over 33,750,000, and that's the moment of inertia that is given here. I'm going to find that the, sh the, the normal stress at point A is equal to 3 megapascal. And I'm going to do this for C and D. I'm basically going to copy those. And instead of AB now, I'm going to say CD. And instead of 1.35, I'm going to say 2.025, because that's the moment on that face, on that cross section, which is this moment. And I'm going to get a bending moment equal to 4.5 megapascal. OK, if I want to draw it for CD, I'm going to have a bending moment at the top compression. I mean, normal stress at the top compression and the bottom, I do have a tension. And same as this side. This side, I do have a top compression, bottom tension. OK, at the bottom here for this guy, AB, I do have 3 megapascal. And for the other guy, I have 4.5 megapascal. Just bear with me. Now, I want to find the tension, resultant tension force that is at this, at this shape 2, because the, this beam is made of two layers of wood. I want the layer 2 of the wood. So for example, for layer 2, which is this guy, which is this guy, which is, again, it's going to be that guy at the bottom. I want to find the resultant stress. So the resultant stress, for example, fr at this side, I have the stress. So I'm going to say F tension. I'm going to say the stress, 3 megapascal, like what we did in the previous slide, times half times 75, which is half base times height, times the width, which is 120 millimeter. I'm getting a 13.5 kilonewton from that side. OK? I'm going to multiply by 1,000, 1 over 1,000, to convert the 3 megapascal, which is 3 newton millimeter square, to 3 kilonewton millimeter square, just to end up having a force equal to 13.5 kilonewton. I'll do the same thing in the right side. I'm, and I'm going to end up having a um, resultant tension force equal to 20.25 kilonewton. OK, now what's the point of doing this? The point of doing this is to show you if this beam is in equilibrium, that means if I took any part of the beam out, which is what I did here, I took the lower part out, and the tension force, the resultant tension force, I do have 20.25 from one side, and I do have 13.5 from the other side. So the question is going to be, why is the resultant force due to bending are not equal for member two? They are not equal because I don't have a uniform bending. So because I, I, I don't have a uniform bending, that's why they're not equal. So the other question is going to be, how much additional force is needed to achieve equilibrium? So make, to make the part two in equilibrium, I just want to find what is the difference between them. So I'm going to say 20. 0.25 minus 13.5, I'm going to get 6.75. So there should be a 6.75 difference or 6.75 uh, added to make this part in equilibrium. But the question will be, where will I add this 6.75? So 6.75 need to be added within the cross section, sorry, within the beam, within a surface that's connecting to the other surface so that the beam itself can resist it. So what I'm proposing here, I need to add this 675 along with this 13.5 so that this is in equilibrium. And the 6.75 going to be on that surface. So I need this surface to have a resistance to that 6.75 by, by multiple ways, either by adding glue so that I'll add a glue here. So when, when point two, when the part two want a friction 
or one a slide, this glue is going to resist it, and this glue is connecting one with two, so it's going to work together, or either at the bolt here. If I didn't do so, you're going to find a failure that's going to happen, for example, in that beam. So what you see here is also like a glue lamp, and when I apply this force, you see how they are sliding. And when they slide, that means that there is a failure that happened. There is a failure in the glue that happened, or whatever the connection between the surface. So we need the 6.75 to be resisted, otherwise it's going to slide. And when it slides, it's kind of failure because that's when the beam is not acting as a one unit. And if it's not acting as one unit, it is now not resisting the load that it was supposed to resist. And also you might end up with a failure like this. That means the glue it wasn't strong enough to resist that sliding. That's why it broke or it, it slided. And you see here, you know it's shear because the surfaces are parallel to each other. So there is a friction here. So that's the shear due to bending. So to summarize, non-uniform bending will cause an imbalance. And this imbalance needs to be resisted through a shear force that is developed internally in the beam. So non-varying or like non-uniform bending moment will cause an imbalance. And in this balance or like this inequilibrium need to be resisted by that shear force. OK, now we understood this concept. So now let's, let's generate an equation, or let's derive the shear equation due to this. We, we came up with manually, for example, the, Im, like the forces that need to cause the equilibrium, which was 6.75. We did everything manually. But let's come up with the equation so that we don't need to go through all this steps together. So what I'm going to do here, I have this beam, and I do have this part, which is delta x. I do have a, b, c, d, e, f. So like what I did before, I studied one part of the beam, which was part two in the example one. I took one part out, which is like the one layer of the glue lamp. But now let me take a part that is a, b, E, D. So I'm going to take this part out. So if you look in that delta X here, I'm going to take this part out, which is A, B, E, D, and I'm going to study it, OK? Which means when I take this part out, which means I want to find the shear that is happening here. What I did in the previous example, when I took one, one part out, I wanted to find the shear between them. That's why I cut at the interface between them. Now I'm trying to generalize this. So if I want to find the shear at here, for example, E, so at, at, at uh, Y, so I'm going to find the shear here. So I'm going to take this guy out, A, B, E, D out. OK? And I'm going to name this area that I took it out, this area, A dash. OK? So I do have this area, and then I took this part out. And due to that load, we concluded before that from the right, from the left, sorry, we have M. And from the right, I have more moment, which is M plus delta M. And this delta M is V times dx. OK? So I want to do this. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now, I want to find the bending stress, like what I did before. It is basically what I did before. I want to find the bending stress for that face and the bending stress for that face. So the bending stress, let me start with this face to the left, which is this face. At any point, A, B, or C, they're going to have the equation which is A, B, C, I'm going to say moment M, Y over I. OK? That's the moment. And Y going to change for either A or B or C. And for the, other, for the other face, which is this face, the bending stress is not M, Y over I. Now it's M plus delta M, Y over I. 
And using the answers that I'm going to get here, for example, if I do have a numbers, I will be able to draw the bending moment, sorry, the normal stress distribution on that surface or, or on that cross section, which is going to be here minus plus, And here I'm having minus plus. Okay, since I'm taking this part out, which is A, B, E, D, I'm going to take this part out as if what I'm doing here, I'm taking this part out, which is this guy. Okay, so I'm just taking it, I'm just like taking it out. So if I want to take it out, I want to find the force that will be applied here, which is going to be compression, F to the right, and then I have F to the left. I want to find them. So how should I find them? Given that I know that the stress is here, as if I calculated using this equation, and at this part, I want to find the area here. Because again, for this area, which is A dash, it is AB, which is AB. So to find this force, I want to find the volume of the stress for this trapezoid, right? I'm not going to do it um, manually. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to write it in a symbolic way, which is going to be F to the left is as if I'm, I'm having multiplying all these stresses by area because stress time area is a force. So I'm going to say integration stress times area, but now not all the area, it is the area dash because this is the area dash that we agreed on. So if this is area dash from that side and from the other side, this is area dash. So F left is equal to stress integration stress times area dash and also F right is going to be integration stress times DA dash. Okay. Now I have these forces. So what I want to do, I want to find what is the imbalance that's going to happen. So if you know from the left, I have F left and from the right, I do have F right. And of course, this F right going to be larger because it, it came from M plus delta M. We, we said that in the, previous, in the previous slides. So the F that I need to add to balance this, it's going to be in that way. And it's F horizontal. So let's do something now. Let's now, so if we added the FH, that means this, this element is going to be in equilibrium. So let's take summation FX. And if I took summation FX, it should be equal to zero if this element is now in equilibrium. So if I said summation fx is equal to zero, I'm going to say f left plus f horizontal plus, not plus now, it's going to be minus f right is equal to zero, which is basically f left plus f horizontal minus f right is equal to zero. What was f left equal? I'm going to take this integration and I will say integration stress d area dash plus f horizontal minus f right which was integration stress d area dash okay again the whole point of this just like for me to not lose you i want to find what f that f h equal because i don't want every time to draw the normal stresses to find the resultant force and then get the f h now let's let me get the f h right away so I'm going to say 0 is equal to the integration of the stress to the left, which was equal to my over i. So I'm going to say my over i, d area, dash, and that's the integration, plus f horizontal, minus. But before me putting the equation, I just want to break up this uh, equation. So instead of having m plus delta m in bracket, I want to multi I want to distribute the m with the y. So I'm going to say my plus delta my over inertia. And since the inertia is common denominator, I want to distribute the inertia. So I want to say my over i plus delta my 
over i, right? That's that's math. It's not it's not a crazy math, I promise. So here's the equation. Now I'm gonna put this in here. So minus integration m y over i plus delta m y over i d area. And if you know the property of integration, which is if I do have addition inside the integration, so I can distribute the integration inside, and I'm going to end up having 0 equal to m, m y over i. For a cross section, m and i are, are constant. So I'm going to take this constant out, m, y, m over i, and then integration y d area plus f horizontal minus integration, I'm going to take m i out and y d area dash plus delta m is also constant over i, integration y d area dash, the whole thing is equal to zero. So what you notice here, you notice that this term going to cancel that term because one of them is positive, one of them is negative, so I'm going to cancel this guy out. And then you're going to end up with fh, which is the f horizontal, is equal to delta m i times integration y d area. And if you remember integration y d area, which is area times y, that's the first moment of area. And this first moment of area going to be around, if I assumed that the horizontal axis is z axis, so now this i will be sub z. And this is the first moment of area, and I'm going to symbolize it as a Q. So this is QZ. So now I came up with the F horizontal equation, which is the change in the moment over IZ times the first moment of area around Z. So here's the thing, and which makes sense. The imbalance of the force that I need to balance a varying moment, it will only arise if I have a change in the moment. If I don't have a change in the moment, that's when I will not have a shear, which is going to be used to, to be equilibrium. So to have a shear force, I need to have a varying moment. If I don't have a varying moment, that's when I don't have a shear force. OK? Now let's try this equation to what we did before. So what we did, we manually found for this problem that the imbalance was 6.75. So let's, let's try the equation that we derived in a moment. I'm going to say f horizontal is equal to delta m qz over iz. What was delta m? We calculated the delta m was equal to 0.675 kilonewton, meet, kilonewton meter, so I'm going to my by 1,000 to convert it to millimeter. And then the first moment of area, which is, for example, for this area, when I cut in here, the first moment of area is the area times, so the area, so I cut in here, right? The first moment of area is the area times the distance from the centroid of the shape to the centroid of the whole shape. So the first moment of area going to be 120 times 75 times 75 over 2. Because I want to find the first moment of area when I, when I want to find the shear here. I want to find the shear here, right? So I want to find the first moment of area of this guy. So area times the distance. Over IZ, which is the moment of inertia around Z for the whole shape, which is 120, 150 cube over 12. And if you did this, you're going to find that the FH is going to equal to 6.75 kilonewton which is what we found before when we manually solve it. So now we know that this equation is valid. And again, the first moment of area of a shape, since we took this shape out, like what we did here, we wanted to study that shape, right? We took this shape out. So the first moment of area of this shape is, is 120 times 75 times the, sen the distance from the centroid of that shape to the centroid of the whole shape. So the centroid of the whole shape was in the middle. So it is 75 over 2. OK, and let me put that up here and let me continue. OK, now we found the force that will balance this beam. So 
if you know that this force is here, this force will happen in that phase, F horizontal. Okay, now let me find the stress. So F horizontal is applied on that shape, on that surface, right? What is the area of that surface? So the area of that surface is delta X times T, right? So if I want to find the shear stress, it is going to be force over area. So FH over the area that is applied on, which is applying shear on, which is delta X times T, okay? If I want to remove the FH and put delta M Q over IZ, there is something interesting that you're going to find, which is that term delta m over x. So what was the change in the moment over a certain distance, which is, for example, dm over dx, which is what is the derivation of them? What is the derivative of the moment? This is the shear. So this guy is the shear force. This is the internal shear force. Or in different words, you can find, you can conclude it that way. Here, for example, delta M was equal to V dx or delta X, which means that delta M over delta X, that's the shear force. So now we came up with the, this equation, which is tau is equal to shear V, or v which is internal shear force, Q over I T, and that's the shear stress. Okay, and this shear stress is the shear stress that is going to happen here to cause the equilibrium due to bending. So there will be shear stress at the interface if there is a varying bending moment. If there is no varying bending moment again, there will be no shear. So let me write now what was every part in that equation. So this is shear stress, and this is the internal shear force. This is the first moment of area of a certain shape or where you, where you want to calculate the stress at, and we're going to practice that. This is the moment of inertia for the whole shape. And finally, this is T, which is that thickness, which means if I want to find the shear here, which is if I want to return this, this guy now back to be a one beam, if I want to find a shear at a point, the thickness of that point or a width of that point is going to be part of that equation, which tells you t is, a, like t, is a function, t is a factor in the shear stress equation, which tells you also that tau is inversely proportional with t, which tells you also that if I have a very small t, that's when I'm going to have a large stress. So if I want to resist shear, I need to increase the width to get a, to get to reduce the shear stress, I mean, like to get a, a good resistance to shear. Finally, what we found, we found that due to bending, we have a horizontal shear stress. But let me tell you something. From lecture two or three, we mentioned that we have a plate element here or stress element here, okay? And we know at the surface of that stress element, we have that shear force which is that guy that we, we conclude, the horizontal shear force. So if I took this element out, okay, and I do have the horizontal shear stress that is due to bending, to have this stress element equilibrium, we already agreed before that I need to have a shear here in the opposite side so that the element is equilibrium in the x direction. But the thing is this element gonna rotate now. So to prevent this rotation, I want to have a counter shear that way, which now shows you an interesting thing. The horizontal shear is equal to the vertical shear at that cross section. I mean, if the element now is repetitive because the stress is through that surface, so at any element inside, I do have a vertical shear here. So the vertical shear that the cross section gonna feel is equal to that horizontal shear. So when we have a varying bending moment, we have a shear stress that is at the internal, at like internal surfaces within the beam. And if it's not resisted, that means the beam gonna slide 
and it's gonna either break or it's, 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 it means it's failure. Okay, so when I have a beam, that I do have a gravity load, that means the beam is bending that way, and also the shear is also gonna be vertical, which is like horizontal now in, in within the beam cross section, and, and it's also vertical in that cross section, like we said. So the shear is gonna be vertical, right? So, and this is what you see here. The shear, for example, is gonna be vertical. But what we, if we have a horizontal force here? So the beam gonna bend that way, and that's when the shear now gonna be horizontal. So the shear now gonna be horizontal that way. So the shear is gonna be horizontal here, and the shear is gonna be vertical here. So I want you to notice something. In that case, when the beam bent, the beam, due to this 100, is bending around y. So y here was the axis of bending. So y, y, that's the axis of bending. And when we had a beam like this, the axis of bending was x. So here is the x. So notice that the shear force, or the shear stress, or the force, they are perpendicular to the axis of bending. And it's important because, let me erase this T section because this cross section is rectangle. So this rectangle, if I do have a vertical shear, now the axis of bending is gonna be horizontal, right? So or if I have a horizontal axis of bending, I have a vertical shear. Why it's important? Because when we want to find the shear stress VQ over IT, this Q is gonna be around X, and the I here is gonna be around X. So, which is parallel perpendicular cube over 12. Unlike in this other case, when I do have a horizontal shear, and the reason why I have a horizontal shear is because I had a vertical axis of bending, now the tau is equal to VQ over IT, and the Q here is around Y, and the moment of inertia was around y. So now I, I do have a different moment of inertia. So it's just important to, un, to, to identify the axis of bending and therefore proceed with the sh shear equation. Now, the thickness. So let's now agree I do have this cross section with a vertical shear. And I wanted to find the shear stress at different location within the beam. So, for example, I'm calling this A, this is B, C, D, E. When I want to find the shear stress at this point, I want to cut at that point, like what we did before. And we're going to separate this beam into two parts, this upper part and the lower part. Okay? So, for the equation, VQ over IT, I need to find that, section, that T or that thickness at A because I want to find the shear stress at A. So whenever you made a cut, all the material that went through your cut, that's your T. So the T at A is gonna be 10. And if I want to find the T at B, I'm gonna have to cut like this. And if I cut like this, my cut went through the two inch thickness here and two inch thickness here. So I have a total thickness of four inches. At C, now it's gonna be this. And this is equal to eight inches, which is two plus two plus four. At D, I do have three inches. And at E, I do have five inches. So that's how we calculate the thickness. So now steps how to calculate or like approach the shear stress problems because we're gonna have to draw eventually the shear stress distribution. So, you first of all locate the axis of bending because based on it, you're gonna calculate the centroid and moment of inertia. And you need to calculate the stresses now at different points within the cross section. So the point's gonna be at the centroid and at any time the cross section or the width change. 
So anytime the widths change, you need to calculate it twice, one just above and one just before. So twice above and below any change in thickness, or in T, and at the centroid. You don't need to calculate at the top and the bottom, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna tell you why in the next example. So I do have an example like this, this T section. I gave you the moment of inertia, and I have this beam with a point load of 100 kips. I draw the shear force diagram, I draw the bending moment diagram. Once I do have a shear force diagram, that's when I know I do have a varying moment. And if I do have a varying moment, I do have a shear stress. So I calculated the, I, 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 got, I gave you the axis of bending, which is gonna be horizontal, obviously, because this beam, if, if I have a T section here, this beam is gonna bend like this. So it's gonna bend around X axis. I gave you the centroid, which is at Y equals 7.375. I gave you the moment of inertia, which is 83.08. Now I want you to start calculating the stresses. For one time only, I'm gonna find the stresses at the top and at the bottom, but you don't need to do that because I'm gonna tell you now why. So for point one, I want to find a stress at one. So I'll say VQ over IT. If I want to find a stress at a point, she stress at a point, I want to cut at that point. So when I cut here, I'm not cutting in anything because now I'm still left with the whole beam. Okay, so I'm gonna write V, which is 50, Q, I will, I will wait on that, the QX, IX, that was given in the question, which was 83, and then the T at one, which was 12 inch. But now what is Q? Q is the first moment of area. So if I cut here, now when I cut at a point, I have I, I divide the shape into two, but now I didn't divide the shape into two because there is nothing here and there is this whole shape. And the Q, which is the first moment of area around the centroid is the area of the shape times the distance from the centroid of the shape to the centroid of the whole shape. So I know the area of the shape, but the centroid from the shape the T section, the centroid of the whole shape is zero because they are coincide or like they coincide in each other. That's why the QX is gonna be equal to zero. And this happen at point one and at point two. So always the shear stress at point one and point two equal to zero. And not only because of this, because also in the lecture of the centroid, When we wanted to calculate the first moment of area of the shape of a whole shape around the centroid, we took an integration, which is the upper, upper which is the numerator part of the centroid equation, which is this guy. When we calculated the first moment of area, we found that it's equal to zero. And the reason why, when we say integration x d area, d area is that area, and the x, which is gonna be for all the shapes that we are adding here, there is another shape that we are adding on the other side with a negative dimension. That's why for each shape we are added, A times B, we have another area, which is A times negative B. That's why they ended up equal to zero. So if I took the moment of area of a whole shape around its centroid, it's always gonna be equal to zero. And that's concept we discussed before in the centroid lecture, which is lecture 11. So from now on, any shear stress at the top or at the bottom, at the top or at the bottom, they're always gonna be equal to zero. So you don't bother calculating it. Now let's move to point two. What is point two? Sorry, point three now. So the, I see that the width changed here. So I'm gonna calculate, I'm gonna name this point, let me call it three. And three here is gonna be divided into two things a three that is just above, which is here, and a three that is just below. Just above and just below, it's just above that, it is like theoretically at the same point. So we are not adding any more or any less area. So this point is same. But the reason why we have point three that is above, so I'm gonna say point three, I'm gonna say, say tau three above, 
or just above and I'm gonna have tau 3 below so both of them will have the same VQ over I but they will have different T one of them the one that is just above when I cut at it because if I want to find the shear at a point I want to cut at that point so when I cut here um, the thickness is 12 inches so let me write it down the shear which is 50 let me leave the Q now in a moment and the inertia is 83 and the T is 12 inches and at the bottom the same thing 50 83 but not 12 inches it is gonna be the one that is just below which is here now the thickness at the bottom uh, just below is 0.5 inches okay now I want to find the Q when we want to find the shear stress at a point which is here now just above and just below they're gonna same you divide the shape into two things so I will divide the shape into this part the flange part and the lower part and you should feel free to calculate the first moment of area for any of them because both of them should be equal so the first moment of area is the area of the shape so let's let's find for that shape so I'm gonna say Q1 I'm gonna find the area of that shape flange which is 12 times 1 inch times the distance from the centroid of that flange to the centroid of the whole shape if I know that from the centroid to the top is 1.625 so I will say 1.625 minus 0.5 so I'm getting this distance so I'm gonna say 1.625 minus 0.5 and that's the first moment of area of that shape which was equal to 13.5 and an inch power 3 now I want to find the first moment of area for that shape shape 2 what I'm gonna find I want to say 0.5 times 8 because that's the area times the centroid of that shape so this shape has a height of 8 inch so the centroid of that shape is at 4 inch here and the centroid of the whole shape is at 7.375 so to find the distance between the centroid of the shape to the centroid of the whole shape it is basically 7.3 minus 4 inch so I'm gonna say 7.3 75 minus 4 inch and I'm getting 13.5 as well so from now on whenever you cut you either work with the with any of the shape that you already cut so we cut in here we cut in here so any shape you should work with it you don't you don't do the both of them you only do one of them and the reason why they're equal if we went back to this lecture we found that if we divided the shape at the centroid the first moment of area of the right need to be equal to the left that's why this equation when we took for the whole shape it equal to zero so to be equal to zero the right side or the part that we divided need to be equal to the other side so that when you add it for the whole shape it should be equal to zero that's why you need to calculate it for one of them and that's all okay now let's put 13.5 here and the both of them up and up below they're gonna have 13.5 so I'm getting for the 12 inch for this one the just above 0.677 KSI and the below I'm getting 16.25 notice the change in the shear stress that's because the thickness change okay and last point which is at the centroid 0.4 tau at the centroid VQ over IT so when I cut at the centroid I have two options either work with this side with this part or that part obviously the bottom side is easier to calculate the moment of inertia for the first moment of area for that's why I'm gonna use the lower part the shear is 50 the first moment of area I'm gonna say 7.375 times 0.5 times 7.375 over 2 times over 
83 point, I'm going to say 83 times the T, which is now 0.5. And the shear stress here is equal to 16.37. So now I found the shear stress at different points in the beam. Now let's draw the shear stress distribution. So let me erase this and put this guy here. So now it's important just to draw the shear force. So we have a vertical shear force. So the distribution for the shear is going to be vertical. So if I draw the, the working horizontal lines like this, just to know where the shear stress is, and one at the centroid, one at the end, that's the working lines. And now I'm going to draw the, the reference line parallel to the shear force. If it's vertical, then the, the shear force or the shear reference is going to be vertical. So this diagram is called shear stress distribution. OK? So at the first point and that last point, the shear stress is going to be 0. At point 3, which is here at the interface, just above, I had 0 0.677, right? 627. Should I make a straight line? No, it shouldn't be a straight line. So the reason why, we, I do have a derivation for this. So the reason why is this conclusion or this, this thing. So what I did here, I basically, I wanted to find the relation between the shear stress and the change in y. So what I basically did, I took one part out, which is, for example, this area, and I named it y. So y here is a variable. And the reason why it's a variable, because I want this to be valid for any point within the cross section. So if I want to find the shear here at a variable y, I took this area out, and this area if the whole height is h, this is h over 2. And now this is going to be the height of that, uh, that area that I want to take is h over 2 minus y. And that's how I make it variable. And this is from the centroid of that shape to the centroid of the whole shape is h over 2 minus y over 2 plus y. Now, just, just I plugged in, in the equation, which is tau vq over it. And eventually, you can look into this. You're going to find that the tau is equal to some constant, which is as if this is the tau, is equal to constant minus constant x squared. And this is a parabolic equation. And when you have a parabolic equation, which is constant minus x squared, that means it concaves down, which is also, if I rotated this, it is going to be a parabola that concaves that way, that it concaves down, OK? Which also tells you here that if I now want to draw the shear stress, it should be curve that concaves down. So this is the, the point 3 up above. 3 below is 16.25. So I'm going to have a drop here equal to 16.25. And that's the second point in the drop. And the drop happened because we went from a very big thickness to very small thickness. And very small thickness means a very large stresses. So very large stresses is small thickness. But if I want to reduce the stress, I need to increase the thickness. At the centroid, I do have 16.35, 37. And it's going to be like this. And at the end, it's going to be 0. That's why this is your shear stress. There is no signs in the shear stress. So shear stress is basically, it's telling me the, what is the intensity of the vertical shear stress that's happening here. And then it's going to increase until I go, for example, to the centroid. And if I have vertical shear stress here, very big, that's meaning you know that there is like a horizontal shear stress inside which will cause sliding. This is the intuition for the shear stress. Finally, I want to show what is the shear stress for a rectangle section. So for a rectangle section, I do have the derivation here. 
since I do have a very, I do have a constant width, so I can't, I don't need to calculate the shear stress at the top and the bottom, so the only place that I create the shear stress, which is at the centroid. So what are you gonna do? It is VQ over IT, the shear is V, the Q is I'm dividing at the cross section, so I'm having the area, which is H over two, times B, times H over four, which is now the half of the distance here. You're gonna find for the rectangle that the shear stress, hap the maximum shear stress happened at the centroid, which now if I want to draw it, it's gonna be 1.5 V over area. So y you can memorize this for the rectangle. It's very helpful to memorize this. So it can easy now to just draw the shear stress distribution for a rectangle section, 1.5 V over area. Finally, this is, this is what I explained, the intuition for the shear stress. If I have a shear stress here at a point, that's when you know that there is like a sliding inside, okay? Finally, the last thing here, I want also to like to, to, for you to understand what is the shear failure and how it's gonna happen and compare it with the flexural bending. So if I have a bending here, for example, if I'm applying a bending moment, the lower side is in tension, the upper side is in compression. So the lower side gonna have, wanna try to just rip like this because it's wanna break in tension. So either it's gonna break that way or it's gonna crush that way because it, it's like in compression up here. So it's gonna crush here. So let me show you a video for that. So here is the beam that was bending and then at the, f at, at the fracture, look how it bent. So look how it broke. That now it's broken tension. This parts just broke, broke like this. It's in tension, like it broke that way. And then when they zoom in, you're gonna see that there is like a reinforced inside, reinforcement inside and this reinforcement, I don't, I don't think it's, clear but the, the the steel rebars it broke in here so that's like the tension failure due to bending or like that's the bending failure this might break in compression like here so you have either it's gonna break in tension or in compression like what you saw here so it crushed at the above which means it's it, it's crushed in compression from the above but it's also like the same bending moment and the failure in shear as you're gonna see, it broke that way. And the maximum, this is a rectangle sec, sorry, rectangle section, yeah. It happened at the center because that's when you have the 1.5 V over area, that's the maximum shear stress. So the shear stress, the failure here, for a shear failure, gonna happen in the middle, like this. And for the flexural bending, flexural failure, it's gonna cr crack like this. And that's all what I have and thank you.